Welcome to the first garden tour of this season. When I imagined what this garden tour would be like, it was not quite so wet in my head, but this is not the first time Mother Nature has completely and utterly disregarded my imagination, so here we are. If it is your first time in this neck of the woods, my name is Melanie. We live at 2,200 feet in the mountains in British Columbia, Canada, growing zone 10, 910. With the elevation, it gets a little confusing, but we're out here in a fairly short growing season. We have roughly 130 to 140 frost-free days. I just about ate a mosquito. Everything that you see out in the garden today, I started from seed with the exception of the spinach, which is now bolted. Most of our seeds I started in March and only transplanted them out at the beginning of June, so about two weeks ago. This time last year in June, it was around 40 degrees, so obviously this is very different conditions than I was expecting. That being said, the garden is very green. Let's go take a look while we still have a slight break in the torrential downpour. <laughs> We're starting in the raised garden bed areas. However, these are not raised. I have a few... Ah! You guys are gonna watch me excessively slap myself because there is a lot of mosquitoes here in June. We're starting with the butternut squash plants. I have three planted out in these little rings. Like mini raised garden beds, these rings are the tops of the pot I cut up for my potatoes. You'll see those later on. But this way it gets to hold some nice quality soil and get the plant established before it goes into the regular soil underneath, which will eventually become of higher quality. That's the intention. These are the three butternut squash plants. Like I said, there is some calm free planted on this hillside as well. The intention is that these plants will just grow down and kind of help protect from some of the weeds. Nothing else really grows here. I wanted to give it a go and try and get them established in a little more of a wilder area so I don't lose garden space to growing so much squash. This is the blueberry area. I promised you guys an update. Two of the Northland blueberries aren't looking so hot, so I actually purchased more. They still look like they could be budding. They have green, and there is definitely some swelling in the nodes. One of them is dead for sure, and the other one, I'm not, I don't know what it's doing. The Chippewa are the ones here in the front. They've put on a lot of greenery. They have flowers, and I think we're gonna actually get a blueberry harvest off of them this year. The Chippewa is established and doing great. And like I said, the Northland in the back is still iffy. I bought some replacement plants if it doesn't work out. Those were the ones that had a very small dry root bulb when we planted them. I guess not a root bulb, but a root cluster. Their roots did not look great. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Like I said, they're green, the nodes are swelling, but they still have yet to put on leaves at all, especially compared to the Chippewa. They're not looking so hot, so we'll see how it goes and I'll keep you updated. Also in this garden bed is our valerian. It did incredible last year and it is just starting to put on these flowers. This raised bed here is about two feet high off the ground. Um, I'm six foot seven. No, I'm not. I'm five seven. Wrong. <laughs> I'm five seven. It's over my head. It's about two feet off the ground in this raised bed. This gets to be about another two feet tall. It gets to be around, I would say, five, six feet. These flowers are big, white, and beautiful. Valerian is really good for a sleep aid. You harvest the root, and I believe this year will be the first year that we actually go in and harvest some of that root for teas. In front of the valerian, we have some Musselberg leeks. They're supposedly very giant. They did not look so good when I first put them out, and they are just starting to green up and actually stand up right, which is encouraging. I have two acorn squash plants, one there, one over here. Very small, only one main leaf. These took forever to germinate. If you guys have experience with acorn squash and it is similar for you, let me know in the comments below. But this is the only squash that I was concerned wasn't gonna do anything, but here we are, it looks all right. There is some Swiss chard that is just direct sown in here and just starting to come up. I have a few overwintered sage plants that are actually looking like they're going to flower. Some catnip and bergamot down here in the front. 
Now in the lower raised bed here, we have about seven Brussels sprout plants that have sustained some significant slug damage. Like I mentioned, this is the wettest June that I have ever gardened through and I am not used to the slug pressure if I'm being honest. So there is slug damage on these Brussels sprouts. I took off the mulch, which because I'm not used to the wetness, I didn't realize was such a good harborer of slugs, but it makes perfect sense now hindsight 2020 situation <laughs> but uh this is the bed that used to have all of the oregano in we kept one oregano plant there's some vining nasturtiums in the front a few kale plants some thyme and tarragon in the corner there i think the brussels sprouts will be fine there is some slug damage but i have more brussels sprouts in another area of the garden that look perfect so i think this is the year of the brussel the rain is picking up i don't know what to tell you it's gross out here <laughs> but we're doing what we can. Our garlic is looking great. Again, I forget the variety that this is, but I'll put it on the screen for you. There's a few strawberry plants in this bed. I've got some peas that are doing really well against the trellis in the back. In front of those peas, I have some carrots as well as three cue ball squash plants in the back two corners and one right center stage in the front. On this end of the bed, I have some Chinook leeks. There's a sunflower and some cute little pansies interspersed and up in this area. There are also copious amounts of sunflowers in every single one of these beds. I believe it's a Mexican sunflower in this bed, but I wouldn't know because there hasn't been sun in what feels like four weeks. I'm debating whether or not I should include in the video how often I am hiding in a random shed while it pours We have a bit of a nursery going up alongside our house right now. These are all the plants that are still waiting to find a home in the garden. Some of them are tree clippings, some of them are herbs, some of them are perennial flowers. Things just need to finish getting moved around and a few beds honestly are still being built. So these guys are in a little bit of a nursery setup in the meantime. We've got things that I will be keeping in pots like wormwood for example, and we still have copious amounts of lilies, sunflowers, and a bunch of oregano all looking for new homes or waiting for their beds to be prepared. June is busy. Everybody who gardens knows that. Anybody who homesteads knows that. It's one of those things where the to-do list is long, it's never ever over, and you just kind of have to keep your head down, keep plugging away and doing as much as you can because I'll be honest, it's been an overwhelming May and June. We've had excavation done on the property like I showed you all in the last video. We have chickens, so that's a whole new area of challenges and chores maintenance we are spread pretty thin working pretty hard and this rain has kind of put a damper on the spirits a little bit <laughs> i will say the fact that it's been raining so much has made it okay that i have not gotten the irrigation in so i guess there is a silver lining to all of these clouds <laughs> all right into the three garden beds close to the greenhouse up here our rutabaga is taking off I do have my Market More cucumbers planted along the back and they will be trellising up this side. In between, I have our scallions. When I planted these scallions out, they were not looking good. They got real bleachy looking, but they have since then established themselves and seem to be doing great. In each of the corners of these garden beds, I have some big sunflowers. This is the year of the sunflower. I still have probably over a hundred of them to plant, but there's going to be a lot of there's a sunflower and there's a sunflower conversation in this tour. <laughs> like I said, the rutabagas, the scallions, there are a lot of volunteer cosmos as well as calendula in this bed. The market more cucumbers along the back. This is a vining nasturtium, more volunteer cosmos and some marigolds, some sunflowers over in this corner and as well as opal basil. I've never gotten it past the stage you see it at now. It's really dark right in there. I've never managed to get it much past this, but maybe this is the year. This area we direct sowed in around April. We've got two lines of red kale here, just two lines of random miscellaneous lettuce mixes. It's sowed quite densely and I just come in and I cut it off about three inches from the bottom and then it grows back. And we've been harvesting it 
pretty consistently. Definitely something we're eating off of a lot right now. And then there are giant champion radishes in that corner and then small bell radishes in this corner. This spinach here is the only stuff I did not start from seed. I picked it up at a hardware store and we've been eating off of it for probably around four weeks already. And obviously it is now bolting. That's all right. It's done us a great service and has been delicious. We have some bok choy and some parsley in here as well as watermelon radishes along the edge of this bed. This is a massive chamomile plant that overwintered. I've let it be here. It has not flowered. The other ones in this corner of this bed have. We'll see what it does. Along this trellis here, we do have three lemon cucumber plants. When these spinaches have finally seen their last day, I'll take them out and the cucumbers will have a little bit more room on this side of the trellis. Again, with a massive chamomile plant that has overwintered, it was doing really well, but the rain over the last few days here has really taken its toll on it. We'll see what it does. I'm not opposed to taking it out, but I also wanted to see if it was going to produce a lot. We'll see what happens there. Along this trellis here, we've got a suyo long cucumber. We've got four of them right in there. Boom, 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 boom. We've got a bright blue morning glory. This is not the same as the weed. This is a cultivated variety. It's looking a little rough. Again, we're struggling with this amount of rain, but the intention is that it'll grow up right in the center of this trellis and be a very lovely blue pollinator attractor. I have pole beans on the corners of these beds here, about six or seven plants. They are the Blue Lake variety. Hopefully they will take over as soon as they get some sun. And I have a determinant glacier tomato popped in this bed because it was extra and I needed to put it somewhere. You're going to see a common theme with the glacier tomatoes in this garden tour. They have all been kind of extras and because they're one of the only determinant varieties I have, they're the only tomato that I can plant around. When I planted them out, they looked really, really rough and it is a potato leaf variety. So it's new to me and honestly, how much it has bounced back is really impressive. I have had tomato struggles this year. In the front of this middle raised bed, we have three purple tomatillos. They're actually starting to put on flowers right now. On this side here, we have our purple mist peas. They are an indeterminate and should grow quite tall. They are looking very good compared to some of the other plants who have not been enjoying this rain so much. I've got a few different marigolds. There is a perennial basket of gold plant here in the middle, two different lemon sunflowers, and then some sweet basil interplanted as well. This is our Lovage. It's a perennial celery. It produces prolifically and we've been eating a lot of it and enjoying it. Their uh, celery flavor in this guy is like way stronger than grocery store celery. It's quite spicy. We dehydrated some of these leaves and the intention is to grind them up and maybe put them in a salt. So a celery salt or just have it over the winter for a seasoning. There is lots of volunteer cosmos in this bed. We have some wandering onions, I guess. I've never planted them, they're just here. Lots of radishes. Something that is new this year, which we have really focused on, is actually growing in pots. I'm not a big container grower. I mean, this is only my third year gardening in general, so trying to increase the productivity and get things in pots, which has been really new for us. You'll see them everywhere, but the ones here in this front garden bed, See if I can move my very wet camera. <laughs> um, we've got sage, we've got some wild flowers. It's not all food production, but a lot of herbs and such we've been putting into containers. I've got catnip in this guy, some more cosmos, pansies. I started so many plants and I didn't want any of them to go to waste. So we've really been trying to utilize some containers. <laughs> On this side here, we have some patty pan squash. This is the Benny green tint variety. So it's like a very light green. We have some dinosaur kale that's growing in the center here. This rain, like I said, is kind of beating everything up, but seems to be doing all right. There are three or four sunflowers in the middle of the garden bed there and some volunteer nasturtiums and calendula that I've just let do their thing. 
onto our Royal Burgundy Bush Beans. These guys have just kind of been chilling. They've not been growing. We have not had sun. Don't know if I've mentioned it, but June has been kind of rainy. <laughs> we have Swiss chard that overwintered as well as a fresh planting of Swiss chard. This row here is Cylindra beets, Bull's Blood beets, Boro beets, and Chiaga beets. Chioga? The stripy pretty ones. We also have some random mushrooms growing, which I'm not gonna do anything about because I love me some mushrooms. We don't eat those ones, but they don't seem to be doing any harm. We also have random volunteer orac, which is a lovely leafy kind of green. It's got a texture of spinach. I've really enjoyed it, so I'm happy that it showed up. This is a rosemary plant, again, growing in containers. Um, it's getting a lot of water. It's not gotten a lot of sun. It's doing all right. Back here, like I mentioned, we have the glacier tomatoes in containers. They are determinants, so they should be fine with just those tomato cages, but trying to expand into some more container gardening because we have a lot of pots that we just haven't been using. On this side of this garden, we have some ground cherries and hollyhocks. So I've got three ground cherry plants. Well, actually, okay, I have two ground cherry plants. And I think this one over here is a tomatillo. It was in the ground cherry container, but the leaves and the, the coloration is very different. We'll see how it goes. Either way, it has enough room. I'll pop a tomato cage on it. It's growing. It's happy. So this looks really gnarly over here. I just moved our kitchen scrap compost, so don't mind the the mess. We have, this is kind of like a mint bed or things that you don't plant in garden beds because they take over bed. So we have lemon balm, peppermint, and thyme in this garden bed here. Mint on the edge, lemon balm in the middle. This is a row of cilantro because none of these invasive kind of mints have taken over that side yet. So this bed gets lots of shade. We'll see how it does. I don't have a lot of great luck with cilantro, but never give up. <laughs> this is a comfrey plant that is flowering and the rain has now fully pushed over. It was kind of propped up with this tomato cage, but when the bees are out and it's not torrentially pouring, these are absolutely covered with bumblebees. I'm going to leave it alone for a little while longer and then just use it for some chop and drop. Like I said, a lot more intentional container gardening. These are just some pretty flower pots. This has got some sunflowers in it, some more sunflowers. We like sunflowers, apparently. I've really overcompensated. Last year we had two plants and I was like, those are nice. And now they're everywhere. More just pretty containers. And now we are leaving our kind of, I guess like our kitchen garden, stuff that needs a little bit more monitoring. We're leaving this raised bed area into some of the in-ground garden beds where we have been putting in a lot of work and dirt this season. Okay, so last year I had this garden bed, but we didn't grow anything in it essentially because it needed to have the strawberries cleared out and it needed some good just kind of uh, general garden soil as well as a lot of compost. This ground here is better than the average ground, but that being said, the clay content is still quite high. Drainage issues, it's quite compacted. So we've just really been trying to put in some organic matter as well as do a little bit of aeration. That being said, all of our gardens, we do work off of permaculture principles as well as no dig methods. You'll see some of the newer garden beds that we've started with just cardboard and compost on top. So that is our intention and our goal. But in order to be able to use this as growing space, we have had to dig up some plants out of it aerate the soil so there has been disturbances this season as well as last season. In the front corner here we have some perennial basket of gold which is it looks a lot like an alyssum it's just a bunch of bright yellow flowers right here and then we've got our black beauty zucchinis we've got three of them they're looking small but again we've not had a lot of sun other than that they're quite healthy so I'm hoping we avoid any kind of mold issue and we get some sun soon and they just start to pop these are our Brussels sprouts here that have not been attacked by slugs and are looking quite lovely. We've got some lilies in the back. This is the bed where we took out all of those lilies and all of our strawberries. I'll show you the strawberries once we get down closer to the high tunnel gardens, but this is 
This bed has been a long time coming. We've had to take a lot of stuff out of here and just do a lot of work on building up the wall and getting good dirt in here. I'm very excited to see plants actually growing in this bed this year. We have some pole beans. These are, I believe, the Kentucky Blue pole bean. They're looking a little worse for wear. I kept them in pots for a long time because we were trying to get this garden bed finished. But hopefully as soon as we get some sunshine, they take off. They have hung on to the trellis that we have here, so they're not looking so hot now. Hopefully they pick up in a little bit. There's a common sentiment for most of this garden tour. <laughs> Coming along the front of this bed, we have some perennial chamomile that's come back. Again, those are the beans. Over here, we've got some Thai basil. I direct sowed a bunch of radishes that actually just came up. We've got some calendula plants. I have a lot of weeds coming on here. Just like I mentioned, there has been a lot of grass essentially taken out of this bed and we're still working on it. There's a lot of thistles because the soil is so compacted, but you can also see some bull blood beets, bull's blood beets. We have the broccoli attempt. Um, it is a purple peacock variety and is actually a hybrid with kale. So hopefully it doesn't mind a little bit of heat and can withstand some more heat than a traditional broccoli that forms a very firm head. That was my thought process. I will be coming in here with some cover crop shortly to protect them from the butterflies, but we haven't had any cabbage moths or butterflies thus far in the season. I will eventually cover those. In the front here, I direct sowed bull's blood beets and they are actually just starting to pop up. You can see them here. That's exciting. There's always a weird time period where you can't weed a garden bed because you direct sowed it and you have to wait, which means, I mean, I'll pick some of the larger weeds out, but I haven't been disturbed or come in and got some of this grass out because I don't know exactly where the stuff I direct sowed is because it's not all up yet. So it's that weird in-between period where I'm waiting for all the radishes and the beets and the, and actually two varieties of carrots that I planted here as well to come up before I come into this bed and start actually taking some of the bigger weeds out. In the back row here, we have Varna leeks that I transplanted out. Those guys are looking great. Behind the leeks, we have just some flowers like calendula and marigolds. I also planted some baby's breath over here. We've got some more lilies and this is the plum tree. On that back row behind the broccoli, we do have a row of boro beets as well as the chioga beets. The the, the cute stripy ones, I can never say the name right. Up here we've got some fava beans. They're growing. They look all right. Some of the leaves have rotted. <laughs> but yes, we've got the Windsor fava beans and I am hoping that they get a little bit more established and start to mean business here pretty quick. Oh yes! Yes, finally! We've got some bantam corn germination just past the plum tree here. All of this stuff is the bantam corn. I have two fairy tale pumpkins that are planted. I will basically let those go anywhere and everywhere they want. I did plant that corn quite close together and I did direct sow the same variety of corn right after it in this empty space. Today is actually the first day that I'm starting to see the corn break the surface. It is the same variety, golden bantam. The stuff in the back here, I started indoors and I wanted to direct sow some as well. I'm doing a lot of kind of a B testing whether I should start stuff all indoors or if I can get away with direct sowing some like I said we do have a short growing season obviously mother nature likes to play games and sometimes it's even shorter than we plan for so I'm confident that I'll get a corn harvest off of the stuff I started indoors but I also direct sowed more to see if it's possible I don't know we'll see how it goes I like starting stuff indoors, but obviously you start to run out of room when you're starting everything like beans and corn, as well as your frost tender stuff like peppers and tomatoes. So it's a lot of work. You end up potting up a lot. If the corn that I direct sowed works well, I won't be starting it indoors again next year. If it doesn't, I guess I have to consider how bad I want a corn harvest. And if it's worth it, then I'll continue to start it in March. To finish this bed up, we've got some hollyhocks and some big, 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 big daisies. 
So in this middle garden bed, we've got our mass amount of raspberries that are quite chaotic. Still haven't gotten around to stringing them up, but they are growing and they're fairly content. After that, we do have some lovely weeds, but also a red currant bush, which is fairly loaded with currants right now. This garden bed, we are still building a rock wall and putting dirt into. So this is essentially what this top bed right here looked like about a month ago. So a lot of work and a lot of progress and a lot of wheelbarrows of dirt. So we're getting closer. We do have some things planted down at this end where the wall has been put in. We've got the rose bush. There is some rhubarb in the corner. It's looking a little rough, but it just got transplanted and has anchored in, and I'm assuming it's going to be doing great. Rhubarb is quite hardy, and I'm excited to see how that does. And then we have two more pumpkins. I did not know if our garden bed here was going to be ready this season, so I did not plan having a lot of stuff in it. These pumpkins are extra pumpkin plants, and they'll take over this whole area and kind of help keep the weeds down if we don't get around to planting out this garden bed. This is our massive pile of soil, which we keep quite close to where we need all of the soil. Now, up here in the front, we just have some ornamental perennials. There's lavender, lilies, basket of gold, yarrow, and catnip. We've got another big old thing of lilies right here by our stand. This corner, there's more lilies. There's some echinacea, another basket of gold. Up here on this kind of landscaped area where obviously it's not complete, but working on it. There's more basket of gold and echinacea. This whole front area is basically my mom's accomplishment. She did all of this work, moved a lot of this gravel, put some landscaping fabric underneath while I was at work and made incredible progress. So this whole area is new and it's where we're going to be putting our hive tunnel. This guy here is strawberries. I didn't show you this, but these white containers are actually old speakers that I took everything out of, painted them up, drill holes in the bottom, put some little skids underneath so we could slide them around if we would like. And we just put all of the strawberries that we took out of our top bed into these white planters. Took some work, but I think it's gonna really serve us in the long run. We haven't been able to get a strawberry harvest for many years, simply because of birds and animals. This way it's going to be a little bit more contained and we might actually get to eat some strawberries. This is an area where we have a lot of stuff in pots and we put all of our tomatoes and our peppers. So let's go in and take a look at the strawberries. We've got some lemongrass and zinnias in pots here. Same with this side, lemongrass, zinnias, some more lilies, and this guy's got sage and a few sunflowers. Because we have such a short growing season, the high tunnel is really for season extension. It's summertime. I've already missed the whole protecting it from potential spring frosts. So that's why I'm okay with planting the tomatoes and peppers out right now. And we'll hopefully have the high tunnel built, at least mostly built by the time fall comes. That gives us a few weeks this summer and then we can hopefully protect it and extend our season on the latter half of this season. The high tunnel will then be ready to go for a full season's worth of season extension next year. How many times can I say season in a sentence? We do try to do no-till as much as we can and work off of those principles. So we laid down cardboard, put on our garden soil on top, and I actually just planted out these tomatoes yesterday and it has been torrentially downpouring ever since. I did have these tomatoes in pots for an extremely long time. I was trying to wait out the rain and see if I could plant them out when there was some more sunshine. And we also had to get these beds established. So there was a lot of reasons Basically, this is me explaining to you why my tomatoes might not look that great. <laughs> now, the first 11 tomatoes in this garden bed are a potato leaf variety called Stupeca. All of the tomatoes that I chose this year are intentionally fast producers and are renowned and known across the globe for being semi-cold hardy. And if not cold hardy or minorly tolerant, they are very quick producers. This is the first time I grew potato leaf varieties. The Stupeca, as well as the Glacier that I showed you earlier, are both potato leaf. From my research, I couldn't find any real difference in their care or their maintenance. It's simply that they have a leaf that is shaped like a potato plant. So if you know something that I don't know about potato leaf variety tomatoes, let me know in the comments below because I couldn't find anything that was very different when it came to their care. After the stupeka comes the Moscovich, which is again an early producing Russian variety of tomato. 
In the center of our high tunnel area on the carpet, which will eventually be the path in the high tunnel, you have to use your imagination in this garden tour because there's a lot of things that are still in progress and it, it looks a little rough right now, but just imagine a very lovely wood chipped path eventually. These are all of my potatoes. Well, that's not true. These are all of my potatoes that are in pots. I've expanded my potato world this year into container growing. I'm going to be doing an entire video like I did last year on my whole potato harvest, the in-ground bed, as well as these pots. So I'm not going to get too much into it, but that's what these are. If you haven't checked out my last year potato video, I'll leave it in the cards above. Now onto the other side of our high tunnel area. This is where I planted the peppers. This side of the high tunnel will get more sun and hypothetically be a little bit warmer. Other than that, there's no real reason why I chose to put the peppers on this side. I do have a few miscellaneous tomatoes that I only have a few plants of at the end of this pepper row. So I grew early girl last year. I'm growing them again. There's three plants as well as a wee little Eigelheart yellow cherry tomato. I'm honestly not expecting much from this because it was really delayed. It had issues in our indoor care system. It had a rough start. So we'll see how that goes. But let's look at our pepper varieties. Starting here, we have King of the North, which is a red bell pepper that is very good for producing in cooler, shorter seasons, i.e. why we have it here. We grew it last year. I simply grew them out in our garden beds up by the greenhouse with no season extension, no cover, nothing. And I got a bunch of bell peppers around this size and they were all green. I ate them, they were delicious, but we did not get a red juicy bell pepper. Peppers are kind of an unrealistic crop for us to grow. However, I can't rule them out and I wanted to try them again with a high tunnel. So here we are, only three this time around, but we'll see how they do. I also mentioned earlier that I'm doing a bit of an A-B test with our peppers this year as well. We have these ones that are in ground in our high tunnel area, as well as the ones I showed you in the pots. The only type that I don't have in the pots, but I have out here, are the King of the North. After our King of the North variety, we move on to our cayenne peppers. I have three of them. When it comes to pepper spacing, I'm always a little torn. I don't give them as much room as I give tomatoes. There is a cute little saying that peppers like to hold hands, meaning that they like to touch their other fellow pepper plants. So some of them have a little bit more spacing. Some of them are a little closer together. Again, I'm all about the A-B test. <laughs> From the cayenne, we move into the Anaheim. I actually only have two of the Anaheim out here. The other two are in the greenhouse. These guys are kind of like a banana pepper and I'm really excited to see how they produce because they're not just a, a seasoning pepper. You, you can use them and eat them as like an actual vegetable. You know what I mean? There's like a difference between a paprika pepper or a cayenne pepper. Those are often just used as spices, but the Anaheim and the King of the North, you can use them as like a, a vegetable, not just a seasoning. Over here, we've got, stay tripod. We have three paprika plants. These ones are the smallest by far. I kept the larger paprika plants in the greenhouse. Despite being smaller and the fact that I planted them yesterday and it's done nothing but rain since then, these peppers actually look better than I was expecting. <laughs> After the paprika comes the peppercini. I had surprisingly good germination on the peppercini plants. I have six of them out here, two of them in the greenhouse. They are planted fairly close to each other, but good garden soil, lots of compost options. They'll do great. I think. I've never grown peppers, so that's a large assumption. Now, walking out the back of the high tunnel area, Lots of mud and some wild roses. Everything is fairly overgrown here, but this is the circle bed. We do need to come in with the weed whacker and get some of this grass under control. I have the red Russian garlic around the perimeter. Now, let's all collectively laugh at my attempt at growing okra. I'm not taking it out. I don't know what it's going to do. Every single plant, this is one of the better looking ones, let's just say that. Okra might not be a start indoors transplant out in the middle of like the rainiest month in history kind of plant i have some sunflowers in the middle there a lot of weeds and then i have three patty pan squash plants got a little bit of slug damage but i'm sure they'll bounce back once we get some heat and there is also a nasturtium plant in the front there as well this bed has a lot of weeds there is no cardboard underneath it 
and it has been a constant battle with grass. So eventually I'll probably end up just putting landscaping fabric over this, probably after I harvest the garlic. We actually have, ooh, look at that. We have one here too, I believe. Yes, we have some garlic scapes coming. This is my first year growing garlic and I don't really know the timeline, but I think, and don't quote me on it, but I think that you're supposed to let these grow a little bit and then cut them off and you can eat the garlic scapes. And then you know that you're about to, you're getting closer to being ready to harvest the garlic. So this round bed, it looks like the garlic has progressed quite nicely. Here we are. We have three determinant Manitoba tomatoes in the back. We have a Lufa squash plant right there. This front area of this garden bed is actually open. I'm going to be putting ground cherry plants here. They just have not been transplanted out. This is a, like a three year overwintered sage plant. Sage is not normally a perennial here. And I have never seen sage flowers before, so I'm leaving them. I'm excited to see what they look like. But yeah, it's kind of cool that this plant has survived two winters now. This is his third season, especially because I actually tried to kill it. So here you are. Good job, sage. Over here, we've got golden bush pencil pod beans. They are a little pale. Oh, my camera's fogging up. It's wet out here, guys. They're a little pale. They've not grown a lot. They need some sunshine, but they out here. So in this second garden bed, I have some radishes here along the edge. There is echinacea in the corner. There are three Minnesota midget melon planted along the back there. I will trellis them up this trellis. I also have a blue morning glory in the corner there. I direct sowed four or five okra plants in this bed. So I'm waiting to see if they come up before I come in here and try and weed. There is a volunteer nasturtium, a few volunteer calendulas, and I will be planting in this front area a few brown cherries. I'm hoping this bed does good with okra. It has a lot of sun exposure. I decided to direct sow it here as opposed to transplant them out. This is the round bed that's very overgrown right now, and I transplanted the okra into that bed. Obviously, it did not work out well. This is my second attempt this year to get a bit of an okra harvest. I don't know. When summer hits, it's really hot here. I thought okra would be good for the 40 degree days that we usually get. I think just getting it started in this wet of a season right now has been difficult. Now, let's go take a look at our first no dig bag we ever started. Oh good, my dog walked through here. Like I mentioned earlier when I showed you the potatoes in the pots, I will be doing a whole separate video on potatoes, but I will show you these are all of the russets and we've got a few of the other varieties like Yukon Gold as well as uh, Seigland or the German Butterball in there as well. This is the same variety that's in the round bed. It would make sense that they're roughly around the same time. I showed you guys in our last video that we expanded this bed significantly, so I actually just planted all of this front area out. A lot of weeds because I'm waiting for all of the plants that we direct sowed to come up before I get in here and clear some of them out, but there are vining nasturtiums, so I'll climb those up the fence. We have a few rosemary plants. I direct sowed a bunch of rutabaga, and I actually see a few of them coming up back there. A lovely sunflower. In the front here we have a carrot variety. Nothing's germinated yet. Oh, not carrots, beets. I lied to you, they're beets. Good thing I make these videos or I'd be lost. But we do have a few beets germinating. That's exciting. There we are. Beets. I don't remember what variety. They might be bull's blood or boro. Anyway, they're there. We also have some opal basil, a few radishes, parsley, sage, bergamot, my dog's fresh prints because he apparently likes to walk through this bed, hollyhocks, four or five sunflowers. This line here is the rest of the Varna leeks that I couldn't fit into the other bed. We have daikon radishes sewed along the perimeter. Our potatoes are looking great back there. Now over here, we have three spaghetti squash. I'm just going to let them basically travel this way off into oblivion if they need to. 
This is where I direct sowed a bunch of candy corn. There is no germination, but the other stuff is just coming up and I sowed this way later than that, so that's not surprising. There is a few marigold plants here on the perimeter as well, but other than that, just waiting for the corn to come through and more potatoes. There are three Blue Lake pole beans that I'm growing up this little trellis. This just happened to be here, so I figured I'd add some height and see if we can get some beans out of it. I do have to get the irrigation going. The list is long, like I said, but it's been so rainy, so it hasn't mattered. I want to irrigate the beds before I mulch them. I do need to mulch these potatoes shortly. If not mulch, put more compost on them. I just want to build them up a little bit. They are starting to get some height, and I want to have maybe another three to six inches of either compost or straw mulch or both. We'll see. Since I work real hard at being transparent with you guys about being a new gardener, uh, new to homesteading, this is my third year gardening, uh, I've also bitten off a lot. We have significantly increased our growing space. We have like three 14 foot long garden beds that we didn't have last year. I have upped my varieties. I have added probably 10 new things I've never, I've never grown anything. So it's really easy to add a lot of things I've never grown to the list. On top of that, there has been a lot of talk and pressure in homesteading and gardening communities and with the world at large about things like food shortages. That's not why I garden. That's never been why I garden or homestead. We have lived out here long before uh, the, the recent economic and world events that have caused many people to switch their lifestyles. Been on here since I was 11. So our motivation has never really been uh, one of fear or one of that, the, the survival kind of aspect of it. That being said, it's hard to not see all of the pressure and the talk of I don't know, global blackouts and all of this, like the prices in the grocery store and the prices of fuel. So that gets to me after a while. I'm susceptible to fear. <laughs> and when you're in a kind of a place of fear, mistakes or losses in the garden start to feel like bigger failures than they are. And at the beginning of this season, I knew I was starting a lot of things I've never started before, like okra, for example. And it's really important to keep that perspective and to remember that, hey, sometimes things aren't going to work out. And just because there's food shortages or people are sowing some fear into the homesteading and the gardening community, that doesn't make you more of a failure because one crop doesn't go, you know? Uh, I've had to play a lot around my mindset and my perception of what I'm doing out here. Motivations change. And while gardening casually has always been part of the agenda, I am looking to hopefully get more of a food yield where I'm, I'm harvesting some main crops and I can store some food and I can up my preservation. And I think that's the natural progression of my homesteading journey this year regardless. Last year I managed to preserve a decent amount of food. We're still eating off of last year's garden and I had a really great time. This year the natural step is to preserve more and to grow more but there's also that added pressure like I said of food shortages and wanting to be a little bit more self-reliant. So it's been a an interesting month, especially because it's been so rainy, especially because I've had slug pressure. I've had other kind of pests that I've never dealt with. The normal struggles of a gardening season have felt extra intense because there is that external pressure and the a little bit of an undertone of fear that I didn't have before, I guess. So I want you to know that you're not alone, I guess, if you are maybe a little more critical on yourself and a little harder on yourself than you should be, or if you're trying to take gardening more seriously, or if you're trying to be uh, more intentional about producing food. Something that is helping me change my perspective is to not worry so much about producing more, producing more, producing more, and kind of feeding that fear mentality, but adopting the waste nothing philosophy. There are things on our 56 acre property that I can eat and I have never eaten or I have never put intentional effort into preserving or we've only preserved here and there because we we thought about it one time but not the next year, for example. So instead of freaking out over losing some okra plants or 
trying to optimize the amount of lettuce I can get into a garden bed. I'm just going to make sure I don't waste any of the stuff that I do have. I'm going to harvest the crap out of my perennial lovage, and I'm going to make sure I preserve celery salt, and I'm going to make sure I go and harvest as much nettle as I can sustainably and dehydrate it for soups over the winter. There is so much that we have. There is such an abundance of food around. And instead of kind of perpetuating the fear that is very real, I feel it. I know other people feel it. It comes up whether you want to feed into it or not. It's there, especially when you're in a homesteading or gardening community or mindset. I'm just going to try to waste as little as possible. I'm going to harvest the dandelions and I'm going to use them. I'm going to harvest the nettle and I'm going to use it, especially at this time of the year because I am at such a high elevation and because my growing season is usually delayed to people who live close to me down in the valley or there are a lot of YouTubers who garden in the southern states or places like Carolina or Arkansas, like very different growing season than I have. So it's hard not to feel behind or feel like my garden is a baby when they're harvesting zucchini already and mine only have three leaves. <laughs> so I think the maintenance of the garden that I'm doing right now is trying to maintain the gardener mindset of progress, not perfection. It's the one of the most beautiful lessons that the garden has to teach you is that it's kind of in the garden's time, not in yours. I can be as impatient as I want. I can be as critical of my zucchini plants and I can compare myself to other gardeners, but the garden will grow when the garden grows things you can only do so much so that's my reminder that's my emotional heart to heart at the end of a 40 minute long garden tour I just hope you guys know that you are doing great growing something is better than growing nothing and I will be practicing being more gentle with myself less critical and I hope that you do the same as always live long and prosper I will see you all back here very shortly with another video